Uh, good evening. I wonder if I could ask you to take your seats now. Uh, I'm Neil Kirkwood, uh, Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture here at the Harvard Design School. And I'd like to welcome you all uh, to tonight's lecture presented by the Department as part of the 2008-2009 GSD Public Landscape Lecture Series. And the purpose of this series of, uh, of talks by invited guests and faculty is generally to portray emerging, as well as in tonight's case, uh, prominent practitioners, teachers, and leaders of the landscape field, and to demonstrate how landscape architects currently think, and how that influences the richness and breadth of project work at the national and international scale. And tonight's speaker, uh, who demonstrates the highest level of leadership in the landscape field is Kojang Yu, Dean, Professor and Founder of the Graduate School of Landscape Architecture at Peking University, Beijing, and Founder and Current President of Turnscape, which with 300, or as I heard left today, 350 design professionals is the largest private design firm in China that focuses on landscape architecture, urban design, and architecture. And tonight he'll give a talk entitled, The Art of Survival, Recovering Landscape Architecture. And Kojan has built a lengthy and formidable resume since graduating from the Doctor of Design program here at the GSD in 1995. He was the winner of the Human Habitat Model Award in 2002 from the Construction Ministry of the Chinese Government the National Gold Medal of Fine Arts in 2004 from the Cultural Ministry of the Chinese Government, and in 2004, he was also awarded an Overseas Chinese Pyre Achievement Medal for his overall contribution to the Chinese nation. He's a senior consulting expert and planning committee member in more than 10 cities and provinces, including the Capital Planning Committee of Beijing, Hangzhou Municipal Planning Expert Committee, and has also served as a member of the Education Guiding Committee at the Ministry of Construction in both urban planning and landscape architecture. But along with many writers, journalists, planners, poets, filmmakers, and photographers, landscape architects have struggled to address the changing nature of modern China. And it's no mean task in a vast country whose character resides in an elusive otherness, a sheer enormity of scale, and a speed of social transformation that stands apart from trends and approaches found in the shaping of the built environment of many other countries and continents. And there are three major, let's say, opportunities and challenges that Kojan has articulated through his work in China in the reshaping of its rural and urban landscape. The first is to find solutions to address the energy and environmental crises that are present there. Second, to seek to regain the country's cultural identity. And thirdly, to enhance through landscape architecture the sense of the spiritual connection to the earth for all its citizens. And the term survival, used in his 2006 monograph, The Art of Survival, and in tonight's lecture title, and originally derived actually from a quote from Ian McHarg, is in the challenge of landscape architecture to recover its role as a relevant art form, to create a new type of landscape in China that sustains humanity, returns people ide people's identity, and unites land and people. And his work has received honor awards by the American Society of Landscape Architects. They include uh, for the Shangshan Shipyard Park, situated across the mouth of the Pearl River from Hong Kong, the Shenzhen Architectural School campus in northern China's Laong province, and the urban development pattern of Taizhou, located on the southeast coast of China, as well as countless awards for many other projects in the Turinscape office, from such bodies as the Architectural Review, the Waterfront Center, and the Human Habitat Award, to name but a few. And in Turinscape's work, he merges with the country rather than standing apart from it. Apartness gives way to interaction and a new kind of artistic encounter with nature. New because it dispenses with the traditional props of human associations, that of nostalgia, sentimentality, 
and the merely picturesque, and resonates with a second, more obvious way that the landscape is socially constructed. The sub subject of his landscape design work in China always appears to be so immediately identifiable, so unambiguous, so resolutely manifest, that they seem at first to need no commentary or indeed interpretation. In fact, much of the work's initial appeal is the astonishing clarity and confidence with which it puts forward its landscape world. Until we come to realize the real mystery within these projects, their first hold on us is perhaps the initial absence of mystery itself. And yet his landscape design work does have an intense metaphorical life. And these precise renderings of regions, parks, lakes, riverfronts, and shorelines are also subjective meditations and expressions on the literal level of a country in flux. The apparent matter-of-factness and frank self-sufficiency of his project work would seem to belong to one of the strongest currents in the present Chinese culture, the celebration of a reality that is starkly presented as nothing other than itself, while simultaneously looking to the past and future, especially things of a new world which could not be truly apprehended by old world habits of simply perceiving, naming, and by doing so imposing meaning. Earlier this year, I had the good fortune to be locked in a room at the SLA headquarters in Washington, D.C. with tonight's speaker, along with six other jury members for the annual National Landscape Design uh, Planning Awards jury. And it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, we had food, we had drink, and some natural light in the room. But what made it bearable over these three days was the presence of Kojang, who quietly but firmly placed overlooked work back in front of the jury members, led intense and sparkling conversations on the detailed merits or demerits of projects, and when exhausted by the task at hand, was gracious to let our other colleagues have their time to advance preferences and opinions, even when they seemed at the time wrong-headed. Kajang, it was a pleasure to share the time with you then. We welcome you back home to the GSD, and I now invite you to the podium to give the lecture entitled The Art of Survival. Please welcome the Dean and Professor Ko Jeng Yu. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful introduction. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, slides on, please. Well, it's a great honor to have our new Dean here, and thank you, Neil, for such a nice introduction and for your invitation for me to come here. And I, 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 today I also very honored to be here with all my professors and teachers. And also I'm happy to have about f at least five of, of my f uh, um, previous students here to join the GSD, actually they're at GSD now. So it's really great to, to uh, come back since 10 years ago, so I left this room uh, 10 years ago, which uh, uh, is amazing. You can, uh, you can feel, my, feel my feeling right now. It's, uh, and I just think I, I own so much to this school. You know, it's, it's all my professors. And, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you can imagine, and they're all here. And, uh, and the four men, you are here, right? <laughs> Richard. So it's, uh, 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 I own so much to this, to this school. So today I'm going to talk about the, the title is something as Neil just quote, uh, uh, a quote uh, from the Ian McHugh, uh, The Art of Survival. Uh, the landscape architecture is not uh, a cosmetic art of gardening. It's an art of survival. It tells people how to find a place, how to design a place for people to live. So today I'm going to talk, so uh, let me get this. Uh, I will give you a little background about China and what I'm thinking. Then I, I will focus on mainly about my approach, my projects. So the so, so first part I talk about is the poetic, nostalgic past of agricultural China, which we have created a picturesque, poetic landscape 
but that it is a result of survival, a result of survival, the art of survival. And then after that, we lose this kind of art. So the city planning and the garden making become totally and cosmetic art of urban design and the civic art of urban design and landscape gardening, landscape art. Then I'm talking about how we can recover the landscape as an art of survival to create new vernacular, new poet uh, poetic landscape. So the first part is about the art of survival that have create, created the picturesque landscape of China, which is still, uh, uh, you can see in rural, rural China. But it is an art of survival. It's one of these cases, 5,000 years ago, is in the uh, Yellow River Basin. One of such disaster cases has is of mud, uh, I mean, mudslide and uh, flood had buried a whole village. You can see the whole village been buried. And, uh, but at that moment, when a woman was buried with her baby in her arm, she raised her head, calling for God, calling for God to help, because no one else can help. But who is God? The so God was the landscape planner, Da Yu. Uh, because he, he is the first king in China knew how to use rule, how to use rule, how to use measures to select safe place for city and lead people where to live and where to cultivate the landscape. So as the king is a planner. It's landscape planner. And from him, the China now how to use the land to divide the land into nine provinces. His father and his grandfather don't know how to deal with water, don't know how to deal with flood. And it began him, he know how to deal with flood, to make friends with flood. So he's a king. He been selected as a king because he know how to deal with flood, how to make friends with flood. And this kind of skill, this art of skill, this art of survival skill being carried on by generations of Chinese, you know, Feng Zhe masters. The Feng Zhe master is also a combination of administration and design. So you can see people how to use measures, how to use campus to select site for safe, for security, for people to use uh, the landscape. So you can see the whole China was planned like that. This is uh, about 1,000 1, years ago. The Chinese imagined the land as a motherland. Each temple, each village, are specially, are carefully, carefully located at a specific site. So the art of survival is about taking place on the motherland. You can see it's typically one villages around the river and especially and specifically located at this site. And it was selected according to this model, the Feng Shui model. You know, the dragons, the, the, the tigers, the birds, the uh, turtles. It's, it's a model of thinking like pick up the safe place to look, to, 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 take place on the land. And this art of survival is about make how to deal with, with water. This is the Lin Chi in, in, in China, in South China. It's been used for two, more than 2,000 years. And it's still in use. But it's used very simple technology. It's not a, an engineering work. It's a piece of art. Because it's not just fulfills the human need for navigation, for irrigation, but also it's beautiful, <coughs> and it also keeps the ecological, the natural process intact. So you can still can see fish go across this where this, this dike, and never stops this natural process. So it's an art of survival. And it is this art of survival, it's in Dujiang Yan, you know, the earthquake just happened in this area. Uh, it's not being affected, actually. So, 
a simple technology being used to divert the water, and the water being diverted across the whole whole basin. Chengdu, you know, the Chengdu, the whole province was irrigated using this simple technology to divert water to make this land a land of paradise, a land of heaven. So water become a, a this all the cities you see are following the water use water as an infrastructure to keep the uh, uh, the city productive and safe. So the art of survival is about the, the, the strategies of making friend with flood. How the Chinese cities in the Yellow River Basin build their cities. You see, two thirds of the area is water. Water pond is pond, so they can contain they can contain water during the flood season and they use the water during the dry season. So the so the skill the art is about how to use how to make flood with uh, with uh, flood, and the flood is the water is also productive. These are in the city. You see, two thirds of the, the the land is used for for containing retaining flood. Retaining water, and it is productive, by the way. So the art of survival is about making, making rice field, retaining water. You see, terraces of rice paddies. They are, they they get they divert water from the from the mountain and uh, and used for these uh, rice paddies. And uh, as what you you can see how the water being used along the streams, but not. Not to destroy the natural process, and every village can use the same stream, sustainably, sustainably. And this is the art of survival is about making a, a, a land productive. It's about land use. You see how the land being used in different ways, for orchard, for sugar cans, a、uh, sugar cans for rice paddies. The villages are selected, are sited at at the slope. At the fro- uh, at the f-、uh, a hill feet, and the forest above, rice paddy underneath, and this water go from the forest through the village and irrigate these、uh, rice paddies. And the art of survival is about planting. You know how to select plant to to, to uh, 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 mix them together, sugar cane and I mean not bananas, sugar canes, rice paddies. It's all about planting. To make a, a, a wise use of the land, so all this art of survival have created this paradise, the Chinese vernacular, the traditional, the old vernacular. We call it the land of peach blossoms because there's a poetic、uh, story about how a fisherman find a land of peach blossom within a、uh, mountain surrounded areas. And this 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 land is productive, safe, but also beautiful. So that's the land of peach blossom, and it's a product. It is a product of survival skill, survival、uh, art. So to conclude, I will say the old of the old Chinese vernacular is about a sacred landscape of ecological infrastructure. You can see to keep the the land for ecological reason. And also a series of land of peach blossoms within these ecological infrastructures that contained in these ecological infrastructures. That's the old vernacular. But now we I'm talking to the second part. Is this old vernacular being destroyed, or under the process of being destruction in the process to the urbanity? That's This, this holistic king, the holistic king's art of survival, now being divided into one a single-minded engineering work, which lead to the destruction of the ecological process, ecological infrastructure. This you can see all these uh, 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 dams across all Chinese rivers. There are twenty-five thousand、uh, dams in in China, which is、uh, four times as much as America. Uh, dams in 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 and about fifty percent of dams in the world in China. And secondly, the travel, this art become 
triple cosmetic art of gardening and the civic design. That's the art of urbanity, which you can see today in China. Every city is like this. It becomes totally cosmetic. And uh, now today in uh, China, the urbanization consumes 50, more than 50% of cement of the whole world, and one third of the steels of the whole world, of the whole world, and another one third of coal of the whole world. But does this consume consumption for what? Number one, the destruction of the ecological process, the ecological infrastructure. All Chinese rivers, from the largest to the Yangtze River to the smallest creek in the city, been channelized like that. Been channelized like that. Uh, it's the same. It's the same module. You see the monument of flood control victory. The dragon being arrested. That's a, that's the idea how we can arrest the dragon because flood is always a, a disastrous threat to the Chinese agriculture and the Chinese city. That's why we think that we, we have to control that. And we use the cement and, this is, and the steel. You can, you can see, you can imagine all the rivers in the rural and in the urban area being channelized, being, being uh, used concrete. And what are this? What, what are this for this the consumption of concrete and the steels. It is the cosmetic art of urbanity. The art of survival is declined into the cosmetic art of gardening and the civic design, which by mistake we call landscape architecture and urban design. This, this you can see in China. It's in Shenzhen. Very typical landscape, architecture, and the city become ornaments. The architecture is ornament, Landscape is ornament. The whole city is an ornament. This process of urbanity or this process of cosmetic art is began, it's not just today. It's not started today. It started 2,000 years ago. When the emperors in, who admire this kind of authentic, authentic real land of peach blossoms copied ask artists, ask painters to copy this kind of landscape and create the garden. You know, the same name, actually, this called the land of peach blossom, the garden, uh, typical garden uh, uh, scenes in China. But what's missing here in this process, in this copying process, is the productivity. Here in this garden, even the peach blossoms bears no fruit. And here, the land of peach blossoms bears abundant of fruit, rice and fish and bamboos, even bamboo shoots. But here, everything, it just become ornamental. That's the garden uh, uh, art in China at the beginning of garden art. But ironically, this art of urbanity, the process of urbanity, did nothing more than accelerate the decline of the feudalism Chinese empire. That's the Grand View Garden in Beijing. It's been burnt 150 years ago, been burnt by the allied armies of European uh, countries. Why not? Because, why not been burnt? Because the emperors don't know how to grow fruit. And the country, the whole country become cosmetic driven. You, you see, this is the process of art of urbanity. For more than 1,000 years, the young Chinese girls were forced to bind their feet or in order to be able to marry certified elites. And the natural big feet were considered to be rustic and rural. That's the art of urbanity. That's the Chinese high culture uh, 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 valued very much. Unhealthy and deprived of productivity. And we can see in other cultures the same. That's Maya. You are familiar with Maya culture, you see. The king of Maya does the same thing. In order to become the king, the mother usually bent, usually deformed the baby, you see, 
even the deform the head and deform the, 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 the hand in order to become urbanized or become king or become part of the high culture. So, as, so China is not a single uh, case. It's all over the world. It's the same, uh, the same process of urbanity. So that's a s- tiny, small feet urbanity. You see the Chinese painting by Chinese high culture, Chinese elites. And this is rustic, rural, big feet, considered to be rural. Uh, so this urbanized, this rural. The same value being carried on to other culture, to other part of this uh, culture. Penjing, the Chinese Penjing. You know, large, large Westerners just enjoy this kind of art of China. Of China, of China. And the gardening, the garden, the Chinese garden, rockery, the same standards being used to, to value the painting, the rockery, and the beauty. The Chinese beauty being painted by Chinese high cultural intellectuals. You know, it's beautiful. But what's missing here, you know, you can you recognize? The missing is uh, productivity. She is flat, you see? She's flat. No breast here. Yeah. So productivity being deprived just for beauty, just for beauty. It's the same thing here. It's the same thing in, in, in the garden. And when you look, I, I walk into this bookstore, the American bookstore and, and the European bookstore. Just so many people from Western cultures write about Chinese high culture, Chinese garden, Chinese poetry, Chinese paintings. It's all about high culture. All about this fake, this fake culture. No one, almost no one write about Chinese authentic, authentic landscape, the vernacular, the vernacular culture, the vernacular art. And uh, that's why the value being carried on for generations and generations. And uh, even the flowers, look at these urban flowers, ornamentals. In the classrooms of Chinese uh, university, we have all the textbook about how beautiful this ornament uh, and no one talk about that. And if we, we, if we even think about these are weeds. They should be took over from the garden, right? These are weeds. But what's the difference here? The difference here is that this one being deprived of its productivity. And this one is productive, you know? It's abundant of seeds. It can grow anywhere. It, 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 it doesn't need any water. Even doesn't need any care. But here you have to care so much energy, material. So it's a tiny feet, small feet. It's bound feet. This rustic, big feet. The same idea. And today, this value being carried on today in urbanization process in China. This is a rural landscape, productive. You know, this oil, the rape plantation, along this along uh, 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 dirty path. And it's the same thing here. After one month, I took the same picture, the same site. So the dirty road being paved is okay because people need to travel, right? But all these productive plants been tra- been 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 wiped out and planted with these kind of ornaments. You see, ornaments. This is a, 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 a hybrid of Burberry's. This is a boxes, color leaved boxes. They have been deprived of productivity again here. And the same story happening in, in China, everywhere in China, you see. This Granite View Garden, by the way. The native plants been took away and uh, replaced with these lawns from America, from Canada. And you have to water it every, every day. And one meter, one square meter of the lawn in China, in, in Beijing, uh, it takes one cubic meter of water every year. So that's that's the story. And the weeds, so what I mean weeds, is a native grass being taken away and planted with uh, this American uh, uh, lawn. And the, the landscape was considered as ornament. So out of the scale square, you see these the people here. The whole square, you know, the car, yeah, it's in the city. So the landscape so become an ornament here. The Italian landscape, you know, Rome, the so St. Peter's here, the yeah, St. Peter here in China, yeah. the Versailles, the Xiangxia Lixie here uh, in China. Uh. 
And architecture also was taken as ornament. You see, that's in Shanghai. You know, people, a lot of people talk about Shanghai, how beautiful they are. I just took all these buildings, landmarks in Shanghai. You know, how, how ugly they are, actually. <laughs> See, it's ornament. They so try to make beautiful, but actually, you know, ornament, ornament. But here are some better, maybe better examples here. The same story here. Beijing, the Burnest, CCTV Tower, Opera House. You know, they are all ornaments. But consume how much steel? See, 500 kilograms per square meter. 500 kilograms of steel per square meter. And this is 250 kilograms per, per square meter. That's 10 times as a normal compared to normal uh, office buildings. That's all these ornaments create a city of ornaments, you see? The urban turn out to be the dentist's toolbox. You see? Can you imagine this dentist toolbox? You get all drizzles. <laughs> you got, you know, drizzle, uh, scissors, all kinds of things when I look at it. So, so it's all made of ornament. And in this process of making ornament of the new cities, we actually totally destroy the old vernacular, poetic, productive landscape. That's Lulu, China. That's Lulu, Hangzhou. Uh, and Hangzhou was considered to be a land of paradise in, in old China, but now become like that. Um, so the cost of this process of urbanization or urbanity is, is the brownfield in China, you see. The whole China is like a brownfield. Yeah, that's Russia. Uh, Russia, green here, Southeast Asia. So you, can, you don't have to even draw the boundary. You can see how China looks like. Yeah. That's brownfield here. See, look at the water. That's in China, we have uh, 662 cities. 400 of them are in shortage of water. 400 of them. And, and, uh, and 100 of them are in a serious problem of water. Beijing, for example, the underground water drops one meter every year. So we have to divert water from uh, 2,000 miles away from, uh, from Yangtze River to Beijing, whole, across the whole nation, to divert water. But, the, but at the same time, the pollution is, is fairly serious. 70, now today, I mean, I get a statistics that shows that about 75% of the water, of surface water, has been polluted. And more than 64% of underground water near the city has been polluted. That's the issue of survival. And at the same time, the habitat lost. 50% of habitat been lost in the past 50 years. 50% of wetland been lost. But at the same time, when we had drought, we also have flood. Each year, each year in China, flood, 10 million people live on flood plan. Each year been suffered uh, with flood. Uh, uh, uh. And the desertification is a process. One third of Chinese landscape been under the threat of desertification. And it become more and more serious because underground water drop. So desertification spread across the nation. So you are going to kill me here. You see, it's a little small donkey uh, which only 7% of natural resources of the world. But we have to care, have to carry 21% of the world population. So you can imagine how can we survive. So that's, but this process, we can solve the process if we can wisely plan the landscape, wisely plan the land. But we destroy, we, we, we destroy the ecological infrastructure. And we, we lose or we destroy the vernacular and lose to the cosmetic art of ornament. That's that is the story of urbanization in China. Uh, now that's why we have to consider landscape architecture as an art of survival. We have to carve it as art of survival. Number one, we have to build, to rebuild this ecological infrastructure across scales. Landscape should lead the way, and land, that's the landscape urbanism. Landscape should lead the way of urbanization process and of all the development across all the scales. The second, 
we need to create a new vernacular to redefine urbanity in contemporary sense, in contemporary China. Now here's uh, what uh, we are doing, what my firm and my school is doing in the past 10 years. First one is, I will use this Kuha's words, okay? <laughs> X large, large, medium, small. We need to build a, we need to find a special solution across the whole nation to build an infrastructure. I would like to quote my professor uh, uh, Foreman's words. Spatial solution is a pattern of ecosystems or land uses that will conserve the bulk of and the most important attributes of biodiversity and natural process in any region. So one big project we are now doing is that we do a national ecological security pattern to secure this ecological process across the scale, from national to regional to local to this very community level to build this ecological infrastructure. To, to think about systematically how to build a landscape, consider landscape as a process and as infrastructure, not as pieces, not as fragments. X-large, national scale, but tonight, I'm not going to talk too much about this planning because I know the audience expect more projects, more small projects. But I say, I will say that this, this is more important, more important, those broad scale, X large and large, this Beijing region, the Beijing ecological infrastructure, we build this ecological infrastructure as the base for urban planning, for urban development, you can see the ecological infrastructure being designed. And become, this, this, become the this ecological infrastructure becomes the framework for urban development. So this, <coughs> this you can see all the scenarios developed based on this ecological infrastructure. This one without ecological infrastructure. That's why you can see urban sprawl, urban sprawl happen. But if you have ecological infrastructure, which have been planned ahead of time, then you will actually stop all this exploring. You can build a, a structure across the landscape. So that's the idea. And then we go to, to large scale and, uh, and medium scale. Large scale, medium scale to, to design the corridors. And there's a local scale, small scale to design the city, design the blocks even. And that's what we did, actually. This is the regional ecological corridors, the river, and we divert the water across the city, actually. So you can deal with flood, make a friend with flood, allow flood to go into the city, and it becomes an infrastructure, ecological infrastructure for the building, for, the, for, the, for this urban, uh, urban pattern. So that's the, the planning part, which I'm not going to talk too much today. But this... The second part I'm going to talk is more about design. The new vernacular to redefine urbanity in contemporary China, uh, which means we need to address the big issues of survival for the people, for the common and ordinary people. The third, we can use new technology and new material. And four, we, it is an integration of contemporary art and ecology. That's I define new vernacular, to care about the land, about the vernacular, about the normal things. There's one, case, one, one project, is to make flood with flood. How can we make flood with flood? The floating garden uh, 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 case, uh, Yongnin, River, uh, Yongnin River Park. This project demonstrates how ecological infrastructure can be built at the local scale. That's the regional scale you can see, then the uh, uh, medium scale, and we take this part as our uh, uh, case project, as a case uh, study. And it's been channelized, as, as you, can, you can see everywhere in China, been channelized. And once the mayor called me to make this site beautiful, to beautify this place, because in landscape architecture is beautiful, make it beautiful. I told him that, no, it's, we cannot beautify this place. We have to do this. We have to, first of all, we have to stop this stupid process 
of channelizing the engineering process. And it takes advice and it stops the whole process. Uh, it's supposed to be channelized the whole river. Uh, you can see it's right here. Uh, but not only doing that, I, we convince them to take an ecological process, to ecological approach to analyze these areas, you know, 10 years flood, 20 years flood, and 50 years flood. And actually, we can follow this flooding process. We can use this land for production, for parks, for greenways, for multiple, multiple functions. And, uh, and uh, so we, we take off, we took off all this concrete, you see. This, been, this former channelized river been, been, been totally uh, took over, you, but we use ecological engineering process to give, to give space for wetland, uh, uh, for species, for flocks. And as uh, the, the mayor has told me that when they channelized the river, after they channelized the river, they, they didn't hear any flocks anymore because the flock cannot climb up over the walls. Uh, so we, we, we allow flocks to come back, lay eggs, and you can see fish come back just three months after the concrete been took over. And, uh, and we, we grow it with all this native grass, all these big feet, you know, all these big feet. Uh, it needs no care, no water, no, no weeding even, you know, because they're all weeds, considered to be weeds. The farmers, for 2,000 years, they think these are weeds. So now it become uh, uh, totally recovered. But as you still, you can have art. This, this, is, this is a piece of art, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's for exercises, you see? Exercises. And also allow water to go through during the flood season. This is at a 20-year flood level. So, so flood can go through because this area is, uh, the people are famous for wushu, you know, they put gong fu, wushu. So people exercise here. And being flood, when it's flooded, there's a wetland here. People can still walk across these, these passes. So it's called the floating gardens. Uh, it's all native grass. And even the plaza, the square, is floating above this wetland. So underneath a wetland, you see, water can go through it. But above, you can use, people can use it for, for day to day uh, 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 uses. And, uh, and even this, uh, this, you can imagine here, it's not a special rock anymore. It's a local rock. So we monumental, mo make this local rock monumental instead of ship all this special rock from, from Yangtze River. So, so this vernacular, local, and it cost a, 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 a little. So there's one uh, case is about how to make him flood, uh, make him friends with flood. The second case is how to make urban landscape productive. To, to bring productivity back to our urban landscape, it's a, it's a, 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 a school. Uh, by the way, it's an architectural school campus. It's in North China. Uh, and uh, and this, when the pres president come to, come to me, he told me that all the buildings are built. It's, it's, he spent all the money to build his buildings, you know, all the buildings. And he had no money left for the environment, for the landscape. So he told me, he asked me, how can we make the landscape beautiful? Yet, you don't have to spend money. <laughs> and you have to finish in six months because the students will enroll in, during the September 1st, uh, the 1st of September. So the challenge is that minimum budget, short timeline, and he also wanted to make this campus, ident you know, it's unique, special. So the simple solution is to grow rice. Uh, grow rice, yeah. Instead of making, you know, campus like that, you know, hundreds, thousands of new campus are built like that in China in just the past 20 years. So this campus is totally different. Productive, but the productivity is, is, is post-modern. I mean, it's post-agriculture. It's not agriculture anymore. It's, it's a combination of modern use, People, you know, students here, we, 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 we established all these study spaces in, within these rice paddies. And the paddies are all functional. And we even allow the ships to go into the campus. You know, it's so half a year, I know, like 150 years ago, so you, have, uh, you have cars here. 
but it's functional. It's real. It's real. It's the farmers here come here. They eat. They eat. Uh, eat what's left over from this, you know, uh, this uh, rice and this uh, bug flowers. They use uh, 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 the plant here. Also, all these are crops. The crops. And the students use this space very well. Very well. They start under the canopies, you know, across this this path, narrow path. This this narrow path originally was muddy during the agricultural time, but now it's urbanized. So this is a process of urbanization, of how to make landscape urbanized yet productive and usable for for people. You know, the、so, so、professor very happy. You see. <laughs> <laughs> He walk across the rice rice paddies to to his office to his classroom、uh, office. Yeah, and when you look closely, you know, it's very productive, because every virtually every Chinese know how to grow rice. You don't need to be educated in in agricultural or land uh, uh, in, or, or horticultural uh, uh, classrooms. You just grow rice, simple,、uh, and now becomes the whole campus, become classroom. So undergrad, I mean, all these high school students, middle school students of the city, they come here to learn about rice, about agriculture. You know, that's the big fit things. Okay, that's again the big fit things, urbanity, a new urbanity, and and it become a festival, rice planting festival. Each year, they have festival for rice planting, and at the same time, we bring culture, the Chinese culture. Back the authenticity of the, of this culture, not a fake culture. It's living. It's living culture. Back to this, you know, China, in China we have 24 seasons. All the seasons are related to rice planting, rice harvesting, and and、uh, yeah, this harvesting process.、Uh, so each year they have one season of rice planting and one season of harvesting. So the whole campus become very,、uh, very interesting, lively campus. And we even keep the patches of rice at the corners of the field, because my father, my grandfather, told me that when you harvest the rice paddies, you you better keep patches of rice in the field, otherwise the rats will go to your house, you know. So that's、uh, that's for the rats, for the birds, for the animals. Yeah. So we leave the straws. And birds come here. You see,、uh, flocks of birds, you know, sparrows come to the campus. And the, the president told me that for ten years he didn't see any birds in the campus, and now thousands of birds come to the campus.、Yeah. So that's the story about how actually we can make nature, man and nature,、uh, the relationship. And the rice is, of course, the rice the paddy is very productive. And I didn't mention that it's a, it was the water was a, actually a collect, collected from the storm water in the campus, so the water was used to irrigate these rice paddies. It's a whole cycle, and the rice rice the, the, they call it golden rice, been packed as a token, as a, a gift,、uh, and each year they send this small token, small gift to the Ministry of Education,、uh, because. Uh, uh, the ministry, because the ministry receives this patch, uh, uh, a green package, I mean the gold,、uh, green cabbage of a、uh, uh, uh, package of rice, he he actually go to the campus to visit the school. You know, it's very difficult to invite a minister to go to your campus, but it's,、uh, for, for this university, it's so simple. Just use one dollar value of package of <laughs> rice. They get they they get the minister to go to the、uh, university. So that's uh, 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 how to make urban landscape uh, 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 productive again. Now this third case is another story: how to value the vernacular and value the the neglected, how to recycle this industrial site to recover the brownfield. It's a shipyard park. It's a shipyard. It was built in 1950s. And went bankrupt in the 1990s. It's in Zhongshan,、uh, just across the border of uh, uh, Hong Kong. It's、uh, only half hour, half an hour、uh, ship. This、uh, the what's 
what you can what was seen in, in on the site. You know, the Chairman Mao on the 1960s, 1960s water tower, machinery 1960s. So all these are just uh, been uh, is on, under the way or been taken away by by the developers. The mayors sold out the factory uh, uh, for one million dollar for one million Chinese yuan, uh, and uh, the the guy so as a deconstructor have to the contractor have to sold out sold out all this old machinery in order to get back this one million Chinese yuan. But when I look at this uh, 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 old machinery, I just told this this mayor that all these are treasures, you know, all these are treasures. They're so more than one million dollars. Uh, so the mayor, the mayor, I'm, I'm lucky. The mayor listened and he buy back by one point five million dollars. Uh, <laughs> he buy back, and the buy back. So we create this uh, industrial heritage, a kind of industrial heritage, but for recreational, for daily use, and for Art museum here is an art museum. These are old, old dog, old, old dogs, and there's a water tower here, and there's a water tower here, and the lakes existing. So it's it's built like that. So these are existing. So I go through uh, 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 in detail. The site, but this is, we have to deal with the challenges of the site. This been muddy and uh, and uh, is a brown field. It's fluctuating. The water table fluctuates. One meter every day, every daily, daily. So we have to create this kind of terraced, terraced bank, and plant it with all these native grass. We keep all this dock, this terraced, terraced lake. So ecologically, totally ecologically recovered, but at the same time allow people to access. That's that's the site, the bridge across the lake, the bridge across the lake. And it's the use of this dock, this dock for clubhouse, for all this uh, uh, functional use, this uh, water closet, toilet, and this is from 1970s, this is from 1980s. So it's, it's quite new, but it's still it's a heritage, it's an industrial heritage. I mean, it's not a gigantic uh, uh, structure, but it still it's a history. It's, uh, it, it tells a story of the city. It's a, a structure of 1980s. You can see it's beautiful. And we keep also the real road, but we urbanize it. I mean, make it, make it look nice, beautiful also, but also functional. There's the people here, the retired workers come here every day, and work just along this long uh, uh, real road. These are retired people. And, uh, and when I talk to them, they just get so excited about you know, being linked to the past. They are in tears when they talk to me in tears. He told me the story how they worked here before. So that's the connection, spiritual connection between the land and the people. But in a modern sense, in a contemporary sense, you know, how the machinery has been put back and how been used by the, by, the, by the young generation. And it's the wild grass, the native grass being used. And it's the water towers, we really use recycled water towers to become our lighting lighting towers. We put energy, I mean solar solar uh, uh, ener energy lighting system here, and the another tower we take off all the cement become a become a, a sculpture. So that's built. You see, the lighting tower and the sculpture skeleton tower that's without the cement. And the machinery been put back, and you can see. Pieces being put back as a as a memory of the set and the stories, and uh, certainly we we have new designs to to retell to to recreate the story, to interpret the site by modern people by our people by by our generation. So this is a red box to tell the story of the past experience of these workers. They are living together, you know, at that time the collectivism. They live together in the dormitory. The size. We use the same size of the dormitory for the red box. So it, it tells a story of the red culture, of the past. When you now, many people walk across this gate. There's no, there's not, wo not a word about this, what this box is about. But suddenly people feel that it's about the 
It's a red culture. So red cultural revolution and the socialism industrialization process, uh, uh, history of the past. That's that's a red culture. Uh, you you like this, you know? <laughs> you enjoy this. <laughs> the 1960s, everything was painted red. At that time, at that time, in 1916, uh, Chairman Mao here. So the red box is about the story of the Chinese culture of these past 50 years. Uh, this modern Chinese culture, you know, these red scars, these, they are very happy. This one without red scar, they're not happy. <laughs> <laughs> so red is so important in China. I'll tell you, that's, that's why I wear red. Yeah. <laughs> so red, that's a, that's a red box, the entrance. The entrance to the, uh, to the park, you see the wild glass again. Wild glass, it's a steel box. So each people, all different kind of people, each gener generation, the young generation, the older generation, the youth here, they have totally different reaction to see this color, to see this box. You know, very genetic, very biological reaction, you see, heliotic, heliotic. You know, very contempt, you know, he's very quiet. He's thinking about the past, the history of red culture, and this young generation, the young people. So how, how, how different to have different reaction to this red box even. And now this site, it becomes a very favorable place. Yeah. Even for the fashion show, I just found on the website of the fashion show here happened. Uh, and for wedding, uh, wedding picture been taken every weekend. You know, ten, tens and twenties of couples of here take pictures. So this is totally a new aesthetic, a new vernacular, new aesthetic. So you can see it totally different from the traditional Chinese garden and tra traditional Chinese landscape. But here you get the wild grass, the rustic, this, uh, everything uh, uh, is contemporary, but uh, for the, for the have connection to the land. So the, another case I want to say that uh, is we just finished uh, a project in Tianjin. This site is, as you see, is very salty. It's uh, flat, you know, it's, uh, it's very flat, salty, and uh, dirty debris of the construction uh, 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 materials, the site. So the idea is that how can we recover this, ecologically recover this site for urban, for urban, uh, uh, in urban situation, for storm water management, and for the education, for people to show, uh, allow people to see the local regional landscape. You know, very salty. But one, but also very sensitive habitat here. It's sensitive because it's sensitive following this water table. So you, and the pH. So you get very. You have you you when you get a different content of salt, you have totally different vegetation, different habitat, and very sensitive. Only one inch could make a great difference. So we create all these bubble. We call it bubble gardens, you know, sampling gardens, from high to low, from one, meet, one and a half meter deep to a hill, you know, so you can create all a spectrum of natural conditions to create a totally uh, a spectrum of landscape, you know, of regional, regional landscape. So it's called a sampling of the regional landscape, that's pH values, that's depths, that's depths of, this, of these bubbles and all these bubbles. Now it's, it's uh, 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 what happened here. Yeah, it's been built just uh, over actually two years, been built. This deep bubble, you will see very you know, shallow bubble, you get these bubbles on the hills. So you can create all these diverse natural habitat. So these you can, lilies and the native grass around, cocktails, lilies, you know, these like lily garden, you know, this water, and it's a shallow, sh shallow water, you get this uh, 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 grass, yeah, shallower, this reeds, and reeds, and more shallow, and more shallow, and uh, dry now, uh, dry, and uh, a hill, uh, up the hill, the bubble up the hill, up on the hill. So here, no wa little water, 
but the acid level, I mean the salt level is drop, been dropped quite much. So the water penetrating slows the soil. So here quite much different vegetation you can see. Uh, wild grass again. So that's the case about ecological recovery to create a, a new habitat, but uh, it's quite representative of the regional landscape. It's bubble garden, and, it, and it's sustainable. You don't have to pay a lot of uh, money or, or energy to maintain it. And the last case I want to, to show you is that it's minimal intervention. It's called a red ribbon. How can we like this kind of vernacular, old vernacular landscape? that create been, been created 2,000 years ago with simple technology, minimal intervention, allow, but allow natural process, at the same time allow people to use it. So this is a case in Qinghuangdao uh, in, in North China. Again, it's, been, it's a river. And this part been channelized, as you can see, uh, all those uh, conventional way of channelization. And this piece, the mayor, want to make a difference. So we visited the site. The site is uh, you know, ecologically very, very healthy, diverse, but also dirty. You know? It's a deserted area. It's a former agricultural site, so you can see all these remnants of these irrigation systems and all these uh, wild uh, uh, native groves like that. Inaccessible, unsecure, unsafe, and normally people doing like that. That's what, we, what they have done at the lower reach of the river. As you can see, it's a conventional way in China. Channelize it and beautify it. Uh, so, but our approach is that to minimum intervention to keep everything as it is, even the terrain, if it's, even the seedlings, it's all wild grass, but clean, clean it, make it clean, and put one urban element, which inter integrate all the urban uh, uh, necessary society, ne necessary things: the seating, the lighting, boardwalk, being integrated into this 500 meter long uh, uh, fabric, like this. You see, a boardwalk, seating, lighting, and the planting even planters. There are samplings of these local uh, uh, species uh, to, to, for environmental interpretation. And you can see the Google Earth. You know? It's built uh, in Google Earth. It's built 500 meters long. It's, by the way, it's been named by the Kandanastra Traveler as one of seven new architectural wonders. <laughs> you, you bet. I don't know how they pick it. You know? so it's, uh, but that's built. Uh, it takes only half a year to build these things. Uh, the, whole, uh, uh, the whole park is 30 hectares and, and been built in just, just six months. And in the winter time, you see the seedlings, existing seedlings of from the previous nursery. We keep, keep it. We keep everything here, but uh, people suddenly feel urbanized. Uh, these are local farmers, they're local village people at right, the fringe of uh, urban areas. They come here to enjoy, uh, you know, come here to play music here, you see. The, 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 this uh, wolf tail grass, valley, hardy, you don't need it to do anything about them. It just grow here. It's, it's winding across. It's a former garbage dump here. So it's just, we just put all this wild grass back and, uh, and this wandering red ribbon. Enjoy the sunset, you know, so surrounded by this wild grass and the people, there's like two kids just sleeping, lying on their bed. And the whole family, if it's a whole village you come here, you know, people, you know, three ladies, old ladies, oh, they've been here for a whole day. The morning I took picture at 8 o'clock and at 4 o'clock they're still here. Uh, they're still here, as uh, so people. And also, and, the, and different sections of the red ribbon, they have, you are totally have different experience. So for the old people, for the young people, for the children. It's a totally different experience. This one across this forest. 
you know, this very romantic place, but wild native grass, messy native grass, native seedlings of poplar trees, wild flowers, wild flowers you can throw in just, this is a formal garbage dump, by the way. This is a cloud of pavilions, you know, this is a wild grass. And this is a former irrigation ditch, you see, it just covered with, with this uh, fiberglass material and planted with wild grass. Planted the ditch with grass. And the former ditch, former uh, 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 a dirty road, just paved it, and now suddenly become crowded, crowded with all these people. In winter times, winding across this forest in the snow. And in the night, it's been lit up in the night. You can people how busy they are walking across, walking along this uh, 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 bench. So to conclude, the landscape, architecture, and the urban design is now at the verge of change. It's time for this profession, not in China, not only in China, along the world, all across the world, for this profession to take the great opportunity to position themselves to play the key role in rebuilding a new land of peach blossoms for a new society. That's old China had sacred landscape protecting the land of peach blossom. New China, we need an ecological infrastructure to safeguard the urbanized society. So that's old vernacular based on this agricultural art of survival. So we have new art of survival. We need to create an ecological infrastructure, so landscape urbanism, I will use the word, <laughs> across the nation, not just in the city. <laughs> and the second is that uh, old China had elegant concubines with bound feet, strolling in long corridors, you know, in long corridors. But new China have fleet of foot girls bustling with energies as they race through the urban landscape. Now I quote from uh, Tom Tonner, a Brock article here, he wrote an article about this project. So that's, I end my talk. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I like it, I like to talk. Uh, <laughs> we have some time if, if there are questions from the floor. Yes, yeah. a business school. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> I know, I bet. Um, kind of two related questions. Yes. Transition, um, this transition from the vernacular you know, to the ornamental, I guess I'm curious as to what you think the underlying forces are behind each. Is, like, is it inevitable that there's a shift from the vernacular to the ornamental? So that's one question, because you've got both occurring at different points in Chinese history yeah. as you go through this. Mm. And then kind of related to that, is there any relationship between that shift and the Cultural Revolution? You know, did ornamentalism predate? Did it come afterwards? Did it mm. start with the Cultural Revolution? Yeah. Kind of how did that mm. play out? Well, the, I, I think that's that's very, very complicated answer and also, the, of course, the questions. But I, I would say it's, it's about culture. So I start from this transition from vernacular to urbanity, to urban landscape. It started 2000 years, at least 2000 years ago, when the emperor, not the king, not the king Da Yu, but the emperor. The emperor king, he, because of, of, of he wanted to make a difference from the vernacular. He wanted he want to, to enjoy his urbanized life. That's created the first garden in China. It's Han Dynasty. So Han, Han Wu Da Di. So he creates the garden. So all the it's, so this culture is value this urbanity, the, the same value for the, the bounded feet, the bounded feet, the tiny feet. As I said, it is it, within the culture. It's not only just in China. It's also in Maya culture also. So the transition actually. So it actually have two cultures. The vernacular culture is still existing, by the way, still living. Right, the vernacular culture, people need, still need to survive. But the high culture, they don't have to worry about survive because they have enough people to serve them. 
right? So it's the empress. The problem is that the only high culture being passed through textbook, through universities, you know, through urban design class classroom, through these landscape theorists or historians, and we are educated like that. So we only learn about how to create landscape according to this high culture, to fake, these fake principles. So what I'm talking about, so there's two parallel, two parallel process. But that's, 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 parallel, that's high cultural process cannot solve the problem we are facing today. So only, we can only enjoy as a leisure, as a pleasure, you know. But then today we are facing the art of survival, not only the farmers facing, the whole society, even the elite, even the whole cultural elite, high intellectuals, also facing the same survival issue. That's why we have to pick up this, this another low culture again to solve the problem in order to survive. survive. That's, is that answer your question? Eh? <laughs> second. Oh, what was this? Okay, what second one? Second one was the, was there any kind of intersection between the cultural revolution and the shift? Did the cultural revolution take things back more to the vernacular and kind of lessen, you know, the urbanism and ornamentalism or not? Well, that's very good question, and and only you can answer it if you understand Chinese history. I think you you you're quite good on that because. Actually, the Chinese modernism, modernism or Chinese Renaissance began in early 19, uh, in early 20th centuries, when we called the Wu Si, was a new cultural movement, which actually been uh, started by another Harvard graduate, Wu Hu Si. You know, he's uh, 100 years ago, uh, 85 years ago. He's beginning with the modernization of of Chinese literature, Chinese literature, and the Chinese words, characters even. So now we are using simplified Chinese characters and, 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 and speaking vernacular language instead of those high class language, high cultural language. So that the process begins the modernization or Chinese Renaissance. It's about go back to the vernacular. So that movement is a vernacular movement, a new vernacular movement. And the cultural revolution is another story. Okay. So Chairman Mao wanted to pick up this new cultural movement. To, be, to carry on, to continue, this. so they 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 criticize all this Confucius, Confucianism, this Chinese feudalism. It, that's what I criticize today, but uh, unfortunately, took different uh, 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 actions. They destroy the heritage, not uh, intellectually, but physically destroy the old uh, 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 high culture. So that's about cultural evolution. So I I think. It's, it's very complicated, Chinese history, but if, if you really understand it, that, I, I think it's wonderful, uh, 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 it, it, it could be a wonderful story, how the Chinese process of modernization continue. But what I'm talking about is how to modernize this process, how to, to continue this uh, modernization process, which we started uh, 85 years ago. By, by Harvard graduate, but then who's uh, <laughs> he started uh, philosophy here? Okay, Richard. Richard. Uh. I, I had some, uh, a couple of comments. The first is that when I wanted, to, in, in the Land Mosaics book, I wanted to show that sort of your security idea where the village was relative to the terrain. I, I drew my way and I gave it to Kong John, and he drew the real image that I used in the book. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yeah. The second uh, comment is, um, that uh, the patterns that you show, that is the rice at the Rice University and the various wetlands and the bubbles and what have you, um, and the production, they're, they're magical in their own right. But but as you kept saying, but but I, I don't think it comes out strongly enough, you, you can produce the patterns only if you get the natural processes first. You've got to get the water flow. You've got to get the groundwater. You've got to uh, control the floods. You've got to have the, the the place for the birds to breed in order to get to the, to there and so on. So, highlighting the processes, the flows, and the movements across the landscape is, is sort of the the foundation. You said it over and yeah. over, and it was yeah. there. But yeah. but it's an idea that's very hard 
when we're used to seeing objects and arranging objects, it's very hard to, to think primarily of the processes and then say these objects come out. Last thing I want to say, uh, you're a great tribute to, the, to your own talent and also the GSD educational system, I think. And if five people in this audience uh, have the vision and the, and the success you do, uh, then it's, it's why we're all in education. Thank you, thank you. I, I think it's, I thank you again for your education. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, maybe a question from the students? Um, when, when visiting China, I've always been really delighted how very small um, urban spaces, urban open spaces are used in dense cities very creatively and, and very well used by women doing um, exercises in the morning or children playing after school. So these very tight urban spaces, maybe even like the entry courtyards to um, apartment blocks, I was wondering what kind of recommendations you might have for those very tight um, open spaces. We saw some very large projects today. You mean for, for here or for in, in Beijing? In Beijing or in, in China in general. How to make this tiny space? Yeah. Well, I think it's a simple way is to plant a tree, a single tree, you know. It's because in, in China, yeah, it's serious. In, 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 in old, old Beijing, each courtyard has one or two trees. By the way, they are fruit trees. It's a productive trees. You know, it's a Chinese date, a Chinese khaki, you know, the Chinese bear, the Chinese uh, pomegranates. So they are all useful. Yeah, I, I would suggest if your tiny space, just plant a fruit tree. <laughs> uh -huh. Maybe one, one more question? Another, yeah. Um, how do you think um, your arguments and ideas could translate to America, like both with your uh, criticism of urbanity and you know, possible solutions and, and, and that sort of thing? That's a, a good question. I mean, certainly you are much much more, I mean, being educated about urbanity because the Western culture have renaissance. So that's important. So renaissance, because American culture is basically, you know, you get all the European uh, 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 idea about the beauty, about the aesthetic, about the history, about the building, of course. See? So as a process of, of renaissance is changed, totally changed, totally different to the uh, uh, so that's why I talk of China need a, a similar kind of renaissance to, to break off this old uh, 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 thinking, old urbanity idea. Uh, but still, you have City Beautiful Movement, you know, like uh, 30, uh, 50 years ago, you got City Beautiful Movement, created all those kind of cosmetic art, civic art, and, uh, and we learn a lot. We actually pass this model to China right now. So see the beautiful movement from America now being used in China, unfortunately, unfortunately. Uh, uh, so I, about this, how can we feed back, uh, how can China make contribution to this profession to change the world, not just America, to change the world? Well, I, I, I'm thinking about the profession of landscape architecture. You know, it's come from European you know, in terms of it's landscape gardening. Because at that time in, Euro in European country, like in British, in, 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 in uh, 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 German landscape, it's all about making gardens, about French, you know, French gardens and uh, all this. But in, in early 1900, or, or late, no, late 1900, uh, late, late the American process of urbanization changed, uh, need a new profession. That is landscape architecture. That's what Olmsted, not, not take over landscape gardening, but he created a landscape architecture. So you create a greenway system, you create all these parkway system, and then you develop uh, the same large-scale landscape. That's, that's uh, a profession change dramatically. Also, in McHugh have created this uh, idea of ecological, ecological planning. That's, that's, uh, that's what American have developed. But unfortunately, I think at this time, the American, the American landscape uh, 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 is just too abundant. I think it's too abundant. Uh, uh, I just talked to uh, 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 Foreman, uh, Professor Foreman this morning. Uh, your decision maker or your city maker, you simply don't have to care much about the survival issue. 
Your issue is about comfortability, comfort. It's not about survival. So that's why now it's the law is for Chinese landscape architecture or the landscape art architecture in China to solve the problem, the problem of survival. So just because we are under the threat of the survival, under the threat, you just mentioned the water issues, you know, these, all these problems. So we have to find the solutions. So that's, I think, the next generation of landscape architecture, we should have found this uh, uh, solution in China, find this uh, breakthrough in China, and then we contribute back to the profession of landscape architecture and urban, urban design, of course. And that's why I think then you can get feedback from, from Chinese landscape architecture. Uh, uh, survival issue. Because the survival, the survival is not, a, not for China, but for the globe. But uh, because we are so much close to the survival issue, so we have to find a solution first, not America. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, just, just before we close, I, actually I have the, uh, the, the luxury of uh, spending the weekend at the SLA National uh, Conference down in Philadelphia uh, together with Kanju, so I'll have a chance to uh, discuss further some of his ideas tonight. But for those of you... Uh, might want to turn to his book, The Art of Survival, which was published in 2006, a series of, of papers and actually uh, speeches that he's given. And uh, I'd recommend it to you. It, it's a very good introduction if you're not familiar with all the work, uh, both to his writings and to the projects. And just finally, to ask, show your appreciation for Kanju's uh, uh, lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.